Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody good? Tyson's is just waking up. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good, good. Uh, if you're new to our church, my name is Mike, one of the pastors here. I'm glad that you joined us today. I want to welcome those of you watching online, uh, those of you watching out in uh, NBC Montgomery County and Loudoun and Prince William and Arlington. Uh, it's good for all of us to be together uh, today to hear from God uh, in his word. And if you have your own copy of the Bible, uh, you can go ahead and meet me in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 is where we're going to start uh, today uh, because we're going to be uh, kicking off uh, a new series. Now, before I explain the series, uh, many of you, uh, so some of you, I should say, know that there was a, a pretty significant shift in advertising uh, really around the 1960s. Uh, and the big shift really came around uh, uh, what they were, were advertising. Prior to that period, they would just kind of advertise a product. And this is before, right, a, a, a ton of people owned TVs. And so video, even photography in a sense, uh, wasn't as accessible to everyone. And so really advertising was, was just kind of marketing or advertising a product. Now that shifted and it changed not just the landscape of advertising, it really changed media in general. And the shift happened when they started, when they stopped just advertising products and marketers began to realize the, the power of advertising a lifestyle as a way to sell a product. It's why, and it used to cause a lot of confusion for me as a kid, I used to be like, why are there always like women dressed for the beach in car commercials? I'm like, do sports cars only exist in Malibu? Like, what's happening right now? Why is she necessary for me to have, like, a V8 engine? I don't understand this. Well, it's because marketers realize the power of not just selling a car, but selling a vision of a lifestyle, of, of what you might think of as, as the good life. And this is true now all over advertising, especially with the dawn of digital media. This is true of influencers, right, on Instagram and TikTok and the, the way their lives are so perfectly manicured, although it looks really authentic and just real time in the moment, right? They're casting this vision, giving you this image, this picture of what the good life could be. This is not just an advertising. This also is why politics is so powerful. So if you think about campaign ads, what are they tapping into? They're tapping into your vision, my vision of the good life. What do I think is necessary in order to live the good life? And those ads tap into that. Or think about campaign speeches. Campaign speeches essentially cast a vision for the good life. It's one of the reasons why we have so much division, so much hostility, so much conflict in our culture today because it's not just like we have different political parties. It's almost like we live in different worlds, that we live according to different visions of what the good life actually means. And so those people over there are a threat to the good life. And this is how our politics is oriented. It's casting a vision for the good life. There's so many competing voices that are trying to articulate and captivate our hearts with their particular vision for the good life. How are we supposed to live? How do we achieve what we think will ultimately fulfill us and satisfy us? Now, as we enter into or we find ourselves already in, another very bitter, hostile election season. We prayed as elders, as pastors, what do we want to preach about coming into this fall? And as we prayed and we processed, and I mean really praying, fasting, processing together, pastorally, how do we shepherd our congregation through what is going to be a really difficult uh, political season, election season, what do we want to focus on? And here's where we landed. And this is going to sound like a Jesus juke. It's going to sound like really cliche. But here's where we landed. We said, we want to help our people 
fix our eyes on Jesus during this time. Amen. And not just fix our eyes on Jesus in a generic way. Because that kind of makes it sound like, are you just ignoring the significance and the realities that are represented in this upcoming election? No. We said, hey, we want to fix our eyes on Jesus and the vision that Jesus casts about the good life. Amen. And that vision is probably nowhere more beautifully and concisely articulated than in what many people call the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. And that's what, Lord willing, we're going to be focused on over the next couple of months together. We're going to be doing a study on the Sermon uh, on the Mount, Jesus' words, Jesus' vision. Jesus is, in a sense, I have a dream speech in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And we're kind of tagging or titling that series here as it is in heaven. And here's why, because our hope is that for us as the people of God, and if you're here, you're not a follower of Jesus. We're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that you're watching. Maybe you've been burned. Maybe you've been turned off. Maybe you've been offended uh, by looking at the, the state of Christianity, especially as it relates to politics. But here's what we see in Scripture, that our primary prayer and our primary passion, even in and maybe even especially in an election season, is to be God here as it is in heaven. Amen. Here in my house as it is in heaven. Yes. Here in my neighborhood as it is in heaven. Here in D.C. as it is in heaven. Here on earth as it is in heaven. God here in my heart and in my life as it is in heaven. We're taking that line straight out of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. Your kingdom come, yes. your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount together and hopefully by God's Spirit shaped by that sermon as we navigate through uh, this season. So I want to read for us Matthew chapter 4 verse 23. The Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. I want to read from chapter 4, verse 23, in order to help us get the context together. We'll meet, read through Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. I'm not going to read through the whole Sermon on the Mount today. We're going to be, uh, Lord willing, unpacking that over the next couple of months. But I want to read for us Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, through chapter 5, verse 12. Let's pick it up in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. It says, And Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought uh, him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. That's where we get the title, Sermon on the Mount. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Why don't you take a moment before we dive into this passage, just between you and God, and just ask God to speak to you personally uh, through his word. Take a moment between you and the Lord.
Father, we need you. We need you personally. We need you as a community of faith, God. We need you as a nation. And Father, we need to hear from you. And so, Father, we pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would not only speak to our hearts, but work in our hearts, God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, normally, uh, if you're new to our church, uh, I try to organize my sermons around key points from the passage. But today, everything we talk about from this passage, everything we look at is going to be driving toward one critical question that I think all of us need to wrestle with in our own lives. And so you can feel free to take notes on the details and nuances as we walk through this, but everything we talk about is really going to be driving toward one critical question uh, at, at the end. Now, this sermon series uh, is focusing on chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. But the reason I wanted to read from the end of chapter 4 is so you can get the broader context of the Sermon on the Mount. And the broader context is very simply this, that Jesus is not just another teacher or philosopher offering some insightful ideas. If you're exploring Christianity, if you're exploring faith, you got to understand this about Christianity, that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the ultimate fulfillment of all of God's promises. He's the king of kings. That's not just a religious phrase. What it means is that he is the king who exercises sovereign authority over every human authority. He's the king of kings. He's the one who exercises the authority of God himself because he is God. In person. Let me show you this because in order to really understand what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount, you got to come to grips with who Jesus is. And so Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 is in many ways a a summary of Jesus' day-to-day ministry. And the same summary is repeated in Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. And as you read the Gospels, you see Jesus basically doing three things. He's teaching, preaching, and healing. So look again at uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. It says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues. Now, most of the towns in ancient Israel would have had a synagogue that was the center of of Jewish life. It was a place of of worship on the Sabbath. It was a place of teaching uh, throughout uh, the week. It, it was, it was, it was kind of church, community center, and school, right? All kind of rolled up uh, into one. And so typically when there was a visiting ra- a dignitary or rabbi, uh, it was customary to invite that rabbi to teach from a portion of Scripture. But it was evident that Jesus wasn't just a normal teacher. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, so the end of the Sermon on the Mount, you see this. Look at how the crowds respond to his teaching. It says, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. The scribes were experts in the law of God, experts in the scriptures. And you say, why why were they so astonished? Well, think about it. If you're writing a research paper, high school students, right, maybe middle school these days, I don't know, certainly college students, but if you're writing a a research paper, how do you support your arguments? How do you support your arguments? Well, hopefully you don't just plagiarize and claim it as your own, right? You cite other scholars who are known to be experts in that field. And so you're basically borrowing their authority to back up your claim or to boost your own credibility in in making that claim. Well, that's exactly how the scribes would teach. You see this all over the Gospels. They would always rely on the authority of Moses or the interpretation of a particular rabbinical tradition. But Jesus doesn't teach that way. Jesus don't need footnotes. 
He, he doesn't need somebody to co-sign his credibility. He doesn't have to borrow somebody else's authority when it comes to the scriptures. Jesus taught according to his own personal authority, the authority of God himself. And so you're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus is going to say, you have heard it said by Moses and by all the rabbinical interpretations of the law of Moses, you have heard it said, but I say to you, who do you think you are, Jesus? Jesus' implicit answer is God, the one who made you, the one who made Moses. He's teaching with divine authority. And verse 23 says he was teaching in the synagogues and he's he's proclaiming or preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So he's teaching and he's preaching, which is more of his kind of public ministry. Rewind earlier and Matthew summarizes Jesus' preaching this way. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 says, from that time Jesus began to preach. What was the essence of his preaching? What is the summary that Matthew gives us? Here it is. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near you. Kingdom of heaven is Matthew's way of referring to the kingdom of God. In that culture, the Jews would often substitute the word heaven for God as a way of respecting uh, the, the holiness of God's name. So they would often say things like they would swear by heaven, right, instead of kind of swearing by the name of God. It was a way of kind of keeping the name of God Holy, And so most likely Matthew is just trying to be respectful to his primarily Jewish audience. But he's talking about the kingdom of God. And, and Matthew writes that Jesus went around preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so what is the gospel of the kingdom? Now, before I explain this, it's important to note that people have tried to reduce the gospel of the kingdom to fit their own theological agenda. So some people have tried to say that the gospel of the kingdom is only about social transformation. The physical and social problems being addressed as Christians model Jesus' compassion in the world. So the gospel of the kingdom is ultimately about what we do to make the world a better place. And the social gospel has often been used to sideline the deity and authority of Jesus and our need for his saving work on the cross. Other people have reacted against that and said that the gospel of the kingdom is is not about social transformation. It's only about spiritual salvation. It's not about making this world a better place because this physical world is like a condemned building anyway. God is eventually going to destroy it and Christians will be in heaven forever. So the gospel of the kingdom is only about forgiveness of sin and souls being saved from hell through faith in Jesus. Our only real purpose in life as Christians is just to help people get into heaven. Physical doesn't really matter. Physical conditions, social conditions don't really matter. Really what only matters is people's spiritual condition and really people's spiritual destination. But as you study scripture, you see that the gospel of the kingdom can't be reduced to either one of those. And there's many other kind of reductions or distortions of the gospel of the kingdom. But listen, the gospel of the kingdom is so much more breathtaking and comprehensive than that. A mutual friend of, of David and I is uh, Jeremy Treat. He's a pastor and professor, uh, theology professor in Los Angeles. He wrote a book about this called Seek First, How the Kingdom of God Changes Everything. It's a short little book, highly recommended. But he summarizes the kingdom of God this way. He says the kingdom of God is God's reign through God's people over God's place. So you see this Old Testament, New Testament. Let's talk about the kingdom of God. It is God's reign, the exercise of God's authority through God's people over God's place. 
And the gospel of the kingdom, or the gospel means, if you're new to, new to scripture, gospel means uh, good news or it means exciting, an exciting announcement. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news, listen, that Jesus the Messiah has come to make the kingdom of God available in a more intimate and expansive way than anyone could have ever imagined. The first century Jews who are hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom of God, they had these conceptions about what the kingdom of God meant, what the kingdom of God would look like when the Messiah would show up. And Jesus comes along offering the kingdom of God, making the kingdom of God available in a more intimate and expansive way than anyone could have ever imagined. Here's why. Because when Jesus comes, he comes announcing that God's people would be expanded by a radically new covenant that Jesus would ratify with his own blood. There is a new basis for being included within the family of God. Yes. Jesus would become a sacrifice, atoning for the sins of his people. Yes. And through faith in Jesus and his work as a sacrificial lamb, as an offering to pay the penalty of sin, then people will be brought into this people of God, the family of of God. And that new covenant promised something beautiful that God would, would transform us from the inside out by the indwelling presence of His Holy Spirit. And He'd be building this new community of people who are being changed and empowered by His Spirit as they live on mission on His behalf. And so, this is a radically new covenant changes and expands the nature of the people of God. And it's why when Jesus is talking to the Jewish ruler, Nicodemus, he says to him, unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. You cannot be naturally born into the kingdom of God. You can't be ethnically born into the kingdom of God. You can't be religiously born into the kingdom of God. Just because you were raised in a Christian home does not mean that you are necessarily a part of the kingdom of God. Unless you are born again, by an act of God, a supernatural, miraculous act of God, born again through faith in Jesus, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. God's people would be expanded by this radically new covenant and God's place where he would exercise his good and wise reign and authority now would not just be the temple or the tabernacle or the holy land in Israel, but Jesus was ushering in an entirely new world order. His dominion will one day be fully and perfectly and lavishly extended over all of creation. Yes. Not just one geographical location, but over all of creation. And listen, that shouldn't cause us to neglect the world and the society we live in. It should motivate us to bring the goodness and peace and righteousness of God's kingdom to bear in all of our spheres of influence. That you and I, as ambassadors of the kingdom, get the great privilege of reflecting the kingdom wherever God sends us. It's the mantra of our lives as ambassadors of God's kingdom. Hear God as it is in heaven. God, wherever I am, I want it to be a reflection of heaven, of the kingdom of God. Wherever I am, God, wherever you send me, in whatever conflict or situation or challenge I find myself in, God, I want your kingdom to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we see in Jesus' ministry. Back to verse 23, Jesus' ministry was teaching preaching and healing, healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And here's why his healing ministry was so important. Number one, it showed God's heart for hurting people. All throughout the Gospels, you see Jesus being described as full of compassion. 
heartbroken, disturbed. He's burdened by the pain of people who are suffering. And so Jesus' ministry showed that God cares about suffering. But his healing also did something else. The Old Testament prophesied that the Messiah would come with supernatural power. And so when Jesus healed people, it was kind of his way of kind of blue check verifying, right, his identity as the Messiah. He's, he's, he's confirming the fact that he is the real Messiah. Yes. Like he's the anointed one sent by God to save his people. He is the king that has been promised throughout the Old Testament. Yes. But there was something, something else that was also happening in Jesus' healing ministry. Hear me. Listen, when Jesus healed, he was giving people a preview of what the world will be like when the kingdom of God is one day fully and eternally established on earth. You see, when God created the world, everything in it was good. But the curse of sin has warped and distorted God's creation, including our own hearts, and it's produced all kinds of suffering and sickness and death. Jeremy Treat, who I talked about before, he puts it this way. He says, each miraculous act of Jesus is a microcosm of what God's power will one day do for the whole universe. Here's here's what he means. I'll put it this way, because that was like real fancy theologian language, right? Here's what it means. All of Jesus' healings, they were like commercials for the fullness of the kingdom of God. Amen. Previews of the future. Amen. When the fullness of God spreads over all of the earth. And so you think about it for a moment. You think about it as you read throughout the Gospels. People who were tormented and oppressed by demonic power. When Jesus casts out demons... He's basically making the announcement that in the kingdom of God, Satan and demons will not have the final word. He's demonstrating his authority over demons. You think about diseases, you read throughout the Gospels. You just think about the parents, multiple parents in the Gospels, whose children are sick to the point of death. They're hanging on by a thread. They've done everything they could think to do to try to find some type of healing, some type of relief, hoping for their child's physical condition to change. And all they could think, they don't even know who, and really understand who Jesus is yet. They bring their children to Jesus, begging for Jesus to intervene. And when Jesus heals... Is Jesus' way of announcing, listen, in the fullness of the kingdom of God, disease will not have the final word. I'm giving you a preview of of the life you you long for, the world that you long for, a world where there is no sickness. Sickness is an intrusion in God's creation, and Jesus is giving us a window into the reality that he came to accomplish and one day perfectly Fulfill. You think about death in the Gospels. You think about Lazarus when Lazarus is sick and Jesus kind of takes his time and gets distracted talking to somebody else. And by the time he gets to where Lazarus is, Lazarus is dead and his two sisters are, are angry and they're frustrated with Jesus. Because they say, Jesus, why did you take so long? If you wanted to get here in time, you could have, you would have, you could have saved Lazarus. Lazarus and Jesus says, the story isn't over. He doesn't even flex. He doesn't, I don't even know if he raised his voice. He just tells Lazarus to get up. And Lazarus obeys. Death obeys. Lazarus gets up from the grave. It was Jesus' way of saying in the kingdom of God, death will not have the final word. Not even death can stop the kingdom of God. And so Jesus' healing miracles 
were these previews or foretastes of what was to come. Jesus' healing ministry was a preview of the day envisioned by John in Revelation 21, verse 4, when he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. The apostle Paul would put it this way in Romans 8. He says, on that day, creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. One day, here in heaven, will be in perfect harmony. And until then, the kingdom of God is partially available to us. Right now in this life, through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it won't be fully available to us until the life to come. It's what theologians call the already but not yet nature of the kingdom. It's already here in the ministry of Jesus and the ongoing work of his spirit, but it's not yet the full version that we long for. Jesus is teaching, preaching, healing. That's a summary of Jesus' ministry throughout Galilee. He is declaring and demonstrating the gospel. He is speaking about the kingdom of God and showing people what the kingdom of God is like, and people are fascinated by him. Yes. Matthew chapter 4, verse 24 says his fame spread. He goes viral. Everybody's talking about Jesus, and they're talking about this supernatural power and this authoritative teaching, his fame spread. Verse 25, great crowds followed him. They came from nearby villages. They came from the broader regions. The great crowds began following Jesus because they're fascinated by Jesus. They're curious about Jesus. They're kind of exploring who Jesus is and, and what Jesus is Teaching And so Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, seeing the crowds, and just like Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive God's law, Jesus goes up on the mountain as the very embodiment of God's law. And when Jesus sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. Amen. He taught them. He's teaching his disciples but the crowds are pressing in. The crowds are also listening in. So Jesus is teaching all of them. And in one sense, the crowds, they kind of hear exactly what they want to hear because Jesus starts talking about what it means to be blessed. He starts casting a vision. Just like in our advertising, just like in our political campaigns, right? He, he, he starts casting a vision for what it looks like to be blessed by God. And so verses 3 to 12 are known as the Beatitudes. It's from a Latin word that means blessedness. And we're not going to walk through those Beatitudes today. I know some of y'all are looking at the clock, you're like, we're just starting? The, the Beatitudes, no, we're not going to walk through those Beatitudes today. Lord willing, we're going to dive into them next week. But Jesus uses the word blessed nine times in this short section. And as we start this new series, it's important to know what Jesus meant by that word. In Matthew 5, the original word that's translated blessed is the Greek word makarios. And we're going to dive into that in more detail next week. But let me just say this. I'll, I'll give you kind of more of the details of it. But let me say this. It basically means to flourish. To flourish or to live a beautiful, fulfilled life according to God's design. It's, a, it's the picture of, of human flourishing under the authority and according to the design of God. It's, it's the blessed life. And that's where the Beatitudes can be a little confusing at first. Because Jesus pulls the disciples together. And the crowds are kind of finding their space on the mountain. They're leaning in. They're, they're, they're leaning in to hear what Jesus has to say. He's the one who heals the sick. He, he, he's the one who 
casts out demons. He's the one who teaches in a way that they've never heard before. Jesus is the one who is about to usher in the kingdom of God. And so they're leaning in. And as soon as he, as soon as he says the word blessed, from the first word of his sermon, they're captivated and ready to sign up under his leadership. But then Jesus starts talking crazy. What does the blessed look like? Poor in spirit, grieving, meekness, persecution. What are we talking about, Jesus? What, what is happening? Is this the kind of ad, like the medical ads where at the end they just start, start talking real fast, right, about all the things you're supposed to look out for? Like, what is, what is this, Jesus? You ever thought you understood something? But then you read or you watch or you meet someone who has actual authority or expertise in that particular area and you realize, oh, you've been doing it wrong the whole time? That's how I feel helping my kids with their math homework. (laughs) Certain words that we say. I won't get into it, but salmon or salmon, right? I'll let you figure it out, okay? This is what it's like when you meet Jesus. That you've had or you've been given this vision of the blessed life, the good life, a beautiful life of, of, of fulfillment, of, of flourishing. There's all these ideas about what human flourishing looks like. And it's promised to us in our advertising, in our politics, and in so many other ways. And so we come to Jesus with our own preconceived ideas. And those ideas begin to fall apart as we begin to hear Jesus start talking crazy. And what we see at the outset of the Sermon on the Mount, hear me, listen, is that Jesus is the one who defines the good life. That he's the one who has authority to show us how to truly experience the good life, how to truly flourish according to God's design and under God's blessing. And he doesn't just show us, he doesn't just show us because that would be inspirational, but then it would be demoralizing because if you just showed us what the good life looks like, but we can't actually do it or live it or experience it, then it's not encouraging. It's not encouraging for Simone Biles to show you how to do a double twist. I don't even know the language, right? <laughs> this world-renowned gymnast, it's not, it's not encouraging, it might be inspirational for her her to do a YouTube video about how you can do what she does in the Olympics, but it's ultimately going to be demoralizing and possibly deadly when you go out to try it on your own. Jesus does not just show us what the good life looks like. He secures it for us. secures it for us. How? The perfect picture of blessing, of of flourishing in real time. God in person, perfectly embodying what the blessed life looks like. And yet, the blessed one, here he is on the cross. The blessed one, here he is, being crucified, which was seen as a curse in in more profound ways than the first century Jews could have even understood or imagined at the time. Here is the blessed one, the epitome of human flourishing, and yet he is gasping for air on the cross. Poor in spirit. Mourning, 
over the sins that he did not commit, but that he's paying for, hungering and thirsting, pure in heart, perfectly pure motives, making peace, being mocked and reviled and persecuted for righteousness sake. Here is the blessed one on the cross. Jeremy Treat will put it this way in his book. He says, the crucifixion scene is filled with royal imagery. Jesus is given a purple robe, a scepter in his hand, and a crown of thorns on his head. Even as he hangs on the cross, the sign above his head reads, the king of the Jews. Mark is showing, Jeremy says, Mark is showing through irony. The gospels are showing that the one mocked as king truly is king. But he's a different kind of king. The onlookers ridicule Jesus, saying, save yourself and come down from the cross. Yet Jesus revealed his kingship not by coming down from the cross to save himself, but by staying on the cross to save others. Amen. He says the cross is the greatest display of Christ's reign as power controlled by Love. And then he wrote this. He said, the cross, I love this, y'all. The cross did not derail Jesus and his kingdom work. Jesus is king on the cross, forgiving sin, defeating evil, and establishing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Come on, is that good news? It's good news. It's way better news than my Twitter feed. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, a king who dies on the cross must be the king of a rather strange kingdom. And that's what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. What we see is a rather strange kingdom. And it would be hopelessly strange if the story just ended with Jesus on the cross. I mean, the cross is good enough, right, that Jesus is taking our place for our sins, that this king reveals his power through self-giving love, through self-sacrifice. That would be beautiful and compelling in and of itself, but you and I know the story. We know that Jesus didn't stay dead, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus rose from the grave like he said he would. And so when Jesus burst forth in glorious day out of that grave, his resurrection was an announcement that the kingdom of God is breaking into creation in ways that you and I get to enjoy and experience if by faith we are united with him. Jesus is the king. He's the king. Now, here's where we're going to land. I told you all of this is driving to one critical question. Here's the question. It's a question for you. It's a question for me. If you're watching online, you're listening to this message somewhere, if you're at one of our locations, if you're six years old, if you're 76 years old, here's the question that you and I need to wrestle with in our own lives. Have you been treating Jesus like a consultant or have you truly surrendered to him as king? I don't want you to answer that question too quickly. Is he just a consultant to you? It's a way to kind of upgrade your life with some tips and suggestions and, and, I mean, very good, you know, recommendations. Or is he king? Let me just, as we prepare to close... Let me just help you. Here's some signs that Jesus might be more of a consultant in your life. Christianity is the religious part of your life, but not the framework that determines how you view all of your life. Or 
there's a huge gap between what you say you believe and how you actually live. In fact, if we're honest, people might be surprised to know you're a Christian. Or maybe they know you're a, a Christian, but they wouldn't describe you as a committed Christian. I mean, you're not one of those Christians. Or there are things in your life that you refuse to do or stop doing, even though you know God commands it. Or when you hear God's commands, you assume that it doesn't apply to you since it would be too difficult or inconvenient. As I was processing that, it made me think about foster care and adoption. Something that's so clear all throughout Scripture. Something we've been emphasizing is just a part of our church, but most recently over the last couple of weeks. And so many of us, when we hear a call like that, we just assume that it doesn't apply to us because it would just be too difficult or inconvenient for us. And I'm not saying that everybody's called to participate in the exact same way. I'm just saying that none of us should just assume anything. That we should lay our lives before God. And so I want to encourage you, at most of our locations today, there are interest meetings for foster care happening where you can just open your heart and get more information about how God might be calling you to participate in, to contribute to caring for some of the most vulnerable people, children in our society. Or maybe there's areas of your life where you prioritize your own desires and plans over God's will. Your desires and your plans for your money, for your vacation time, your retirement, the desires and plans that you have for your children or for, or, or for where you want it to live or the relationship you thought you would be in by now. Jesus might be more of a consultant in your life if there are areas of your life where you prioritize your allegiance to your family, your culture, or your country over faithfulness to God's word. Where your family traditions, even though they dishonor God, even though they violate scripture, the traditions and norms of your ethnic culture that when evaluated don't line up with the Bible. Certain assumed values or principles that are just kind of in the air that we breathe as Americans that go unexamined. You throw in our political ideology and we're more committed to our political party than we are to the kingdom of God. And people can tell. Can I add one more that's not on the slide? You're willing to receive blessing from God, but not suffering from him. When life is great, God is good. When life is painful, maybe God isn't even real. And whether you realize it or not, you, you've tied the goodness of God to a certain vision of what you thought your life was supposed to look like. But suffering shattered that vision. And when Jesus is just a consultant, suffering also shatters your faith. Have you been treating Jesus like a consultant who just makes some very good, helpful, but optional recommendations? Or have you truly surrendered? Are you truly worshiping and obeying Jesus as king? Yes. Jesus 
in the Sermon on the Mount is revealing himself as the true king who loves you and who invites you into this weird, crazy, countercultural, counterintuitive way of living. A way of living that is in accordance with his kingdom and his design. And so I just want to leave you with Jesus. Just here, wherever you're watching from, just for you to spend some time with God on your own and just share with him whatever you need to share with him. Maybe for you it's just to say, I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want a relationship with you, Jesus, and I want you to be the leader of my life. Maybe you need to pray that in faith sincerely for the first time or the first time in a long time. Or maybe you just need to confess to Jesus or ask for his help. Or maybe you just want to intercede. I wouldn't start with interceding for somebody else, but maybe the Spirit eventually leads you to intercede for other people, for our church, for our country. I'm going to pray, and then I want you to take a moment between you and the Lord, and then I or one of the leaders at your location will close us up. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And as we let your word rest on our hearts, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take the word of God and you would pull it down into our hearts, Lord God, like seed going deep down into soil, that it would take root and bear fruit in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Take a moment between you and the Lord. Father, as we continue to reflect on your kingdom, your work that invites us into that kingdom, Lord, I pray, I pray that you would comfort, but also stir our hearts as we're reminded of what Jesus has done to make all of this possible for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.